Good evening and welcome to Study Hall. Thanks for letting us come into your living room, your car, your kitchen, wherever you're at. Sit down on the back deck, I hope, looking at the beautiful evening, uh, enjoying some family time. Maybe you're watching us on a tablet or on your phone. Uh, great to be with you tonight and thanks again for letting us uh, come into your life for just 30 minutes tonight. Uh, we're actually, st we're done with questions and answers. Whoo, hallelujah. 12, 13 weeks of questions and answers. So we're going to start some little mini Bible studies that we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we're trying to tie them into our Sunday morning series. On Sunday mornings, we're talking about the healing of a nation. And so tonight, I just want to do a little teaching and talk to you a little bit about helping other people, about helping others through compassion and kindness. Our world right now is a very violent and frightening place. And uh, that's true <laughs> physically in some locations. And it's certainly true, can I tell you this? It's certainly true even verbally on social media. I'm shocked sometimes at how cutting and how unkind and how uh, kind of just mean to each other. Even Christians can be, because we're talking to the church. So even Christians can be with each other on social media. And, you know, sometimes today you post one thing and all of a sudden you got all these haters and they turn, uh, for me, sometimes I post something and all of a sudden the comments turn into an argument about something entirely different. And, and then you have to delete people and tell them, hey, look, let's stay on point. In other words, look, we, we need to be more compassionate. We need to have more kindness. And so we're going to teach a little bit on this tonight. Not that you don't know how to do it. You're the Thursday night crowd. But this is for you to share with that mean person that you know. So uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer and, and then we'll dig into this a little bit tonight. So if you got your notepad ready, got your Bible ready, uh, got your listening ears on. And again, when we're done tonight, uh, as soon as we finish, as soon as we're done, you'll be able to go on the app and every slide we show you tonight, everything we talk about, you'll be able to download it all. So it's all there. You don't have to worry about writing it all down or filling in blanks. You'll be able to have the whole thing uh, when we're finished tonight. So just sit back, listen. If you want to make some notes of your own, that's fine. But anything we share, it'll be there when we're done tonight. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for these few minutes we can spend together tonight looking into your word. God, we come again with humble hearts uh, declaring publicly and spiritually towards you in our prayer that, God, we, we don't have the answers. We don't know. We cannot understand your word without the help of your Holy Spirit. So, God, enlighten our minds tonight. Help our ears to stay open. Help us to stay focused on what we're listening to. But, God, would you touch our minds by your Holy Spirit, that we might receive the truth of your word, that it would be more than just informational, it would be transformational, that we would be changed by your word, that you would help us to truly be people of compassion and kindness. We're using uh, in our graphic or logo to advertise tonight's study hall, uh, this cute little acronym ARC, Act of Random Kindness. Uh, it's uh, from the movie, uh, it doesn't matter, but it's from a movie and uh, where God is trying to get a guy to build an ark. It's a funny movie. And, um, and uh, he explains to him that it, it is through just acts of random kindness. In fact, in the movie, the first time God, who's uh, just played by an actor and he's just a looks like a regular guy, knows he's God. Um, he takes a water bowl and cleans it out and puts it on the floor and it fills with water and a dog comes over and drinks it. And later in the movie, he explains to uh, the gentleman that he's trying to get to build this ark that, guess what? It is in those simple acts of giving someone a glass of water. The Bible actually says that in the end times, God says that you blessed my people and, you, and, and they say it's during the tribulation and the people say, when did we bless your people? And he says, you took them in, you housed them, you clothed them, you gave them a glass of water in my name. Did you know that sometimes just being kind to somebody is what God expects of us? Uh, and so it, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting process. We're going to look at one of the coolest stories in the Bible, uh, right out of the Gospels, uh, right out of the book of Acts, rather, in the early parts of the New Testament church. And we're going to look at Peter and John. They're on the way up to the temple. You know the story. Can I read it for you? It's Acts chapter 3, and it says this. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
And a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, so that he could beg alms from those entering the temple. Now, before we go to the next slide, let me just tell you uh, that I want you to notice here in this slide that this is since he has been born. Later in this story, we find out that it's 40 plus years uh, that he has been in this condition. So uh, certainly all of his adult life, 40 years, he's been begging at this gate. And, and I also want you to notice here, he's not actually at the gate yet. There are men that are friends of his that are actually carrying him to the gate called Beautiful so that he can beg alms of the people that will come in. Then the next verse says, so when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking them for coins. I've always pictured this in my mind that, you know, he's seated and he's there begging. It isn't. The, the guys are still carrying him and, and he's on his way to this location. And I believe in this conversation, they settle him down, but he's still moving as it were towards it. And, and he sees Peter and John and he, he begins to call out to them, uh, any coins, any coins, alms for the poor. But Peter, along with John, stared at him intently and said, look at us. And the man began to pay attention to them, eagerly expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said to him, silver and gold I do not have. I heard a preacher years ago joke and said, this is proof positive that Peter was married. Now we know he had a mother-in-law, but this is proof that he had a wife. Why? Because he didn't have any money. He, he didn't have silver or gold. That's not true, ladies. It's not the truth. But anyway, I don't know why I even brought it up. Let's move on. He said, but what I do have... I give to you in the name, in the authority, and in the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Begin now to walk and go on walking. I love a miracle that lasts. <laughs> it says, then he seized the man's right hand with a firm grip and he raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong and steady. And with a leap, he stood up and began to walk. And he went into the temple. And I love that. He didn't run home. He didn't go tell anybody. He first went to the house of God. It says he went into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And, and here's the part that I want to look at. Watch this. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the very man who usually sat begging for coins at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement and were mystified at what had happened to him. A lot of times when you practice compassion, when you are kind to people, sometimes we never fully comprehend the effect that that is gonna have on the larger community. When people see you being kind, when, when they see you doing what it is that God has called you to do, we begin not only to touch that life, but the lives of other people also. And that's what I want to encourage you with tonight. Now, someone said years ago that uh, <laughs> sometimes because the church can no longer say silver and gold, have I none? Neither can we now say rise and walk. This is an old saying from an old document back in the late 1600s. And, and I, it, it was a statement against the church because the church had become very, very wealthy. It was a statement actually against the Roman Catholic Church. But I think today we can make it a statement against the church, all churches, our own church, and certainly amongst our own lives. Why? Because what's the sentiment really saying here? What? That because we've got what we need, we've got gold, we've got silver, what? we don't need miracles. I believe one of the reasons that we don't see as many miracles as we are we are sometimes seeking or would love to see is because in our minds we've become so entrenched, so trusting in what we already have. It's hard to trust Jesus when all of our needs are met. This is why many times in the world in which we live in today, when you travel to nations that are gripped by poverty, if you travel to South America, some nations in Africa, parts of Southern Europe, uh, we hear stories all the time of missionaries in China where people have nothing, just kind of eking out a living every day, and they need a miracle, they need a healing. What's the, it's, look, there's nothing else. They can't go to the hospital. There are no hospitals. They can't go to the doctor. They don't have any money. They have to trust God. And, and I'm not, listen, I'm not putting down your wealth or the blessings that God has brought into my life. 
I'm just saying sometimes we can become so reliant on those things. The last thing we do is pray. It should be the first thing we do. So uh, let's take a look at these two men and we're going to look at uh, the story and we're going to look for a few insights on how we can help people. So I I don't want to go back and read the whole story, but it starts off now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And it's so important that we notice this because what we're going to do tonight is we're just going to look at some simple, ordinary things that you and I need to know, need to understand about sharing with other people, about being compassionate. And so if you got your pen, if you like blanks, you can fill it in, but uh, you can get these notes afterwards. The first observation I want to make to you tonight is this, that miracles happen in ordinary moments. I'm, I'm overwhelmed sometimes as a pastor when I hear about genuine, real miracles, that they happen in the ordinary moments of life. Now, I know there are mountaintop miracles, and, and I know that there are miracles that happen when, you know, everything's aligned and the stars come into play. I, I get all that. But it's interesting to me that some of the greatest miracles of life change, some of the greatest miracles of salvation that I have heard, is just... It was just an ordinary day. I I stopped at the grocery store and then I went over my friend's house for a cup of coffee and someone was there and they started to talk politics and then we went to religion and all of a sudden someone shared Christ and next thing you know, I I was being led to Christ. It was just an ordinary day. You know, sometimes I think we miss the miracles because we're looking for the miraculous. We're looking for that rainbow and I, I love rainbows. But uh, can I tell you something? God is there all the time. God isn't there just when there's a rainbow. He's there in the rain. He's there in the storm. And he's there all the time. This day obviously was a little different because something wonderful happens. And Peter said, look at us. We have the answer that you need. Supernatural faith obviously rose up in Peter's heart. If you read the story over and over, you'll you'll see that, look, Peter seems to know what's about to happen. Peter isn't saying to him, silver and gold, have we none? You know, so guess, I guess what? We can't help you, dude. I'm sorry, we broke. No, no, no. When he says it, it's part of a whole sentence. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I'm going to give to you. I believe that God had already spoken into Peter's heart that this man would be healed. I can't digress. I can't go back But man, if you didn't listen to the last four weeks of our question and answer period where we talked about the difference between believing and faith and then figuring out how faith overcomes fear and that that faith actually turns into a vision. God can actually give us a vision of things that he wants to do, of things that he's going to do, and he can show it to us before it ever happens. I don't, listen, I know some will debate me on this, but as far as I'm concerned, I believe that Peter knew at this very moment when he said, Silver and gold have I none. I believe that Peter knew this man's going to walk today. This man is going to be healed. God is going to glorify himself in this moment. And so, uh, although it was an ordinary day for everybody else, and that's what being compassionate can do. That's what being kind can do. That's what being the person that can bring that arc, that act of random kindness into somebody's life, is if you practice it, if you do it here, if you do it there, in an ordinary moment, like I said, in the grocery store, uh, with with the bank teller, with a young lady that you meet just kind of standing in in the grocery store. God can do something miraculous because you are ready to say, God, I know that you're going to do this. Listen, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra right in front of it. We must learn to do ordinary things with extraordinary love. Our rallying cry as the church must be carpe diem, seize the day. We seek to make our lives and the lives we touch extraordinary. This is our heart cry. This is our desire. The world is broken right now. The world is full of hatred and everybody's looking for an answer. And the answer is Jesus. The answer is the hope that he can bring into a heart. And so the next time you're talking to somebody or the next time you're responding to something on social media, don't jump into the to the garbage like everybody else. Don't jump into the the nonsense. Say something positive. 
Say, look, I know you guys are all over the place and I know you're arguing right now, but you know what? Jesus is the common denominator. You may look a little foolish. Look, it was foolish. If you were listening to this, if you were standing by, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. Look, what do you mean? What are you going to give me? You don't even have silver or gold. You don't even have what I need. But such as I have, arise, he says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise. Well, the guy's lame. The guy hasn't walked his whole life. It's ridiculous what he's saying. Yeah, but he's got a faith vision and he has compassion on this man in this broken hour of his life. The ordinary focus, the ordinary in life focus on what they are getting. The extraordinary think of what they can create. Creativity then, I believe, is the ability through compassion to look at the ordinary and see the extraordinary. In people, in places, in moments. Just leave that there on the screen for a second. I, I, want, I want you to take a picture or write it in your notes. People, places, and moments. This is where we share the compassion. With people, in places, in moments. So guess what? You got to get off the couch and you got to find some places to go. Uh, it may be the grocery store. It may be church on Sunday morning. We're open, 830. Come join us. It may be in a parking lot somewhere, but you got to go for a walk. Talk to somebody. I know it's hard. You got the mask on, but outside you can pull it away. You're far enough apart. You can encourage somebody. You can bring hope into their lives. And, and here's what I know. Miracles happen in ordinary moments. But it's only because people have a desire to create and be creative in the moment. Like I said, listen, anybody can be negative. Any fool can be critical. It's amazing to me how many people can see a problem. <clears throat> I get people all the time. They come to me <clears throat> because I'm a pastor, because I, uh, I got a lot of people working for us and a lot of people in the church. It's amazing sometimes how many people come to me with a problem and no solution. And really, <clears throat> they could have found the solution themselves. Why? And their focus is on the ordinary instead of the extraordinary. Let me be extraordinary. Let me go the extra mile. Now, maybe you need to hear about something, but you know what? It'd be wonderful to hear about something with the solution. I see this problem and I think I can do this. What do you think, Pastor? Go for it. Knock yourself out. Do the best you can. I, I can tell you this as a boss, as an employer, <clears throat> and I've, I've worked in companies where I've had hundreds of people working for me. Listen, I have never, ever, ever been angry or upset with someone who tried something and it didn't work out. We may need to go fix that. We may need to talk about why it didn't work out. They may need to learn a little bit. But I've never lost my cool at somebody said, why'd you do that without talking to me? Listen, don't ever put down initiative. And I promise you this, God will not squash your initiative. There are going to be some people, you're going to go out this week and say, all right, Mark said, I got to look for ordinary moments and I'm going to share compassion. I'm going to share love. If someone looks hurting, I'm going to offer a prayer. Do you want me to pray for you? Listen, you're going to say to somebody, hey, you, you seem a little sad. Is everything OK? Well, I'm going through a hard time. Would you like me to pray for you? No, don't <laughs> don't don't go. Well, fine. I guess you're going to hell. No, just just walk away and say, OK, that's not the moment. But guess what? Uh, you wouldn't get that answer if you didn't ask. And 99% of the time, the answer you're going to get is, oh, I'd love for you to pray for me. And one of the greatest acts of kindness you can ever do is offer to pray for somebody. And when they say yes, don't just write it down and go away and pray for it. When I tell somebody, I was in a bank uh, one day, this is when we were back in not social distancing, and I was talking to a young woman, uh, and, and she was telling me about a problem, and I said, oh, that's so overwhelming. That must be so hard to deal with and to find the strength to just keep going. And I was just being compassionate and having empathy towards her. I wasn't saying, come on, suck it up. I was saying, wow, that's difficult. And I could see her eyes were getting a little water. And she said, yes, it, it really is hard some days. And I said, well, you know what? Would you like me to pray with you about that? That God will give you strength and God will give you the answer. And maybe God would even relieve some of it. Oh, she said, that would be fabulous. And I said, okay, let's do it right now. She said, right now, here? <laughs> I said, yes. And so I just, I didn't, I was in a bank. I didn't suddenly, our father in heaven. I just quietly bowed my head and I said, I just put my hand on her shoulder. And I said, it's okay if I just put my hand on your shoulder. And she said, yeah. And I said, father, I just ask you right now to just bless this young lady. And I just prayed for her there. Listen, can I tell you something? 
I don't know how many times I've seen her since, but almost every time she sees me, she says to me, thanks again for that time you prayed for me. That, that really touched me. Thank you. She doesn't say it every time, but many times when I see her, she's, she remembers that. It's just in those ordinary moments. Miracles happen in the ordinary moments of life. Second thing you got to know about being a person that brings compassion is this. You must be prepared when your moment comes. In other words, you can't give what you don't have. You can't tell what you don't know. You can't share what you don't feel. You cannot give out of a vacuum. So the truth is, don't go to the bank tomorrow. Don't go to the grocery store tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm going to be like Pastor Mark now and I'm going to find someone who looks sad and I'm going to cheer because it's hard to tell who's sad now. They got the mask on. Can't tell if they're smiling or sad or what. But, but I'm going to find somebody and I'm going to encourage them, in other words. But you, know, but you yourself are struggling and you didn't have your quiet time this morning. You didn't seek the presence of the Lord. I'm back to our study from the last four weeks. If you listen to it, you will get blessed, I promise you. We talked about the secret place where we meet with God and we get filled with his presence. Friend, if you don't have something to give, I'm not talking about giving of yourself. I'm talking about sharing what the Lord has given you. What did, what did Peter say? He said, I, I got nothing. Listen, the fact is nothing great is created suddenly. It takes time. Three and a half years of walking with Jesus, listening to his messages, seeing the miracles, uh, had prepared the apostles for this moment. So had the 10 days, actually, that they just spent in the upper room being filled with the Holy Spirit. Woo, talk about power. Listen, so the word for you today, the word for me is, in, in order to help people, you must be prepared. You must be prepared when the moment comes. When you run into someone and their heart is broken and they're sad because of some terrible thing that's happened to them, and all you've done all morning is bemoan your situation. I can't believe this is still going on. I can't believe I still got to wear a mask. What a rotten world. I can't believe they're tearing down this statue. I can't believe what's going on in the world. I can't take it anymore. And then you run into someone that needs help. <laughs> what are you going to give them? That emptiness that you have? When they say to you, I'm going through a hard time, all you'll be able to say is, I know, me too. You've got to be in that season of preparation. Listen. If you got a pen, you really should write this down. I know you could get it afterwards, but you should write it in your own journal. Preparation precedes power. I'm going to let that sink in. I'm going to say it again. Preparation precedes power. There must be a calmness in our preparation for there to be a boldness in our execution. Success happens when the opportunity of the moment meets up with hours, days, weeks, or years of yesterday's preparation. So, listen, you're not going to have a word to bring to somebody. You're not going to have a word to speak to someone unless you have put the time in. So there must be calmness in our preparation for there to be boldness in our execution. If you have spent weeks, months, years having a secret place with God where you meet with him every day at the same place the same time and in your relationship with God there's a depth and a calmness then when you run into some crisis or you run into some calamity in life you're not going to be all freaked out like everybody else ah! there will be this preparation within you that says now is the moment of power now is the moment that God can use me this is what I've been preparing for this is what I've been getting ready for so I, I believe that miracles happen in the ordinary moments of life, but I also believe we must be prepared when the moments come. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. So you with me? Miracles happen in the ordinary. You must be prepared when the moment comes. And then the story goes on. Peter says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. So here's the third thing that you need to know if you're going to be an agent of compassion and share acts of random kindness. Listen, it's important to know what you have and what you don't have. <laughs> it's important to know what you have and what you don't have. It's interesting to me that people struggle with this. People try to be what they're not. People try to say what they don't live. And what we end up is, is hypocritical. 
we try to offer what we don't possess. Peter was pretty plain. He was pretty honest. He said, look, silver and gold I don't have. So he, he knew what he didn't have, but he knew what he did have. Listen, you must become comfortable in your own skin and confident in your calling. I, I meet people all the time. They say to me, Pastor Mark, I don't know how you could get up there and talk in front of all those people. Well, I don't know how I could do it either because it makes me pretty nervous. But I'm confident and I'm comfortable in this is what God gifted me with. And, and so I have to use that gift for his glory. Why? Because it's obviously his gift. It isn't a talent. It's a gift that God has given. Um, and so uh, the Bible des describes this pretty clearly. I I'm going to read a portion of scripture to you. And it's, I'm reading it from the message translation. So it's, it's really modern and hip. It's worth reading it in the King James when I'm done tonight. So you get a deeper understanding of it. But for new believers and for emphasis tonight, I want to read it from the message translation. It's Romans chapter 12, and, and it says this. We are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. You get that? The body that we're talking about, obviously, is Christ's body body of chosen people, his church, his congregation. So each of us finds our meaning and our function as a part of his body. The next verse says, but as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So in other words, if I, if I cut my finger off and say, oh, what a fabulous finger this is. That's the best. Look at that finger. It points real good. It can dial a phone, not can punch the numbers on a phone. If it's as old as mine, it can dial the phone. Uh, it, it says, but, but cut off, it, it wouldn't be much by itself. So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously, marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Wouldn't that be glorious if every person would just be what they were made to be? I think the stupidest thing in the world is for a toe to pretend it's a finger or for an ear to think it's an eyeball. And, and this is what we do sometimes when we try to help people. We try to do things that we're not gifted in. We're not called to do that. So we need to find our wheelhouse. We need to be honest about what we know and, and, and what, we, what we know that we have and what we know that we don't have. He, he says, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or, or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or, or trying to be something that we aren't. Let's just be real. People are dying for us to be real with them. Uh, Romans, Paul goes on to say this. If you preach, just preach. Just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. You know, sometimes when we help, we, we end up taking over. He said, if you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give an aid to people that are in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond because that's your calling. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them because people sometimes can really tick you off. And don't get depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. And then he wraps it all up. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. The King James says, hate evil. Hold on for dear life to that which is good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. <laughs> Listen, nothing limits you like not knowing your limitations. So, look, I, I want you to go out into the world. I, I want you to be the church. The church is not a building. You're the church. I, I want you to figure this out. Miracles happen in ordinary moments, and you live ordinary moments every day of your life. You could see a miracle tomorrow in your family, in your situation. But you must be prepared for that moment. But it's important to know what you have and what you don't have. I, I, I don't really have a lot of time to dig into this tonight. I've read this incredible reading from Ch Romans chapter 12 that ought to encourage you to understand, look, I, I got to figure out what my purpose is, what my gifting is. And maybe, you know, I've talked today about, you know, you're in the bank and you're talking to somebody and, uh, and, and you're in the grocery store and you share with somebody and you pray with somebody. And I know that some of you are listening to that and you're going, ah, I could never do that. I could never just go up and talk to somebody. Okay, then don't, don't say, oh, then I can't do anything. Find out where you can be used. 
We've got some people in our church that are so gifted at writing cards. They find out when people are sick or in the hospital or sometimes they'll just randomly ask the Lord to direct them and they'll, they'll pray about a family from the church and they'll just send a note. You say, I, I could never talk to somebody. Well, yeah, but if you met a coworker and they were going through a hard time, you say, well, I, I couldn't do that. It's not my style. I couldn't, I'm not outgoing like that. Okay, great. But could you go home and pray for them for 10 or 15 minutes and then get them a little Hallmark card and just write on the inside of it? Listen, I, I didn't want to intervene or, or I didn't want to seem offensive to you the other day when we were at work. But when you told me about what you were going through, I just wanted you to know I went home and I prayed for you for 10 minutes that God would guide you and help you. And if there's anything I can ever do, if there's anything you ever need, please don't hesitate to ask. Me. See, this is just, just a different way to do it. You just got to find out what your calling is. What am I, you got to know what you don't have and know what you do have. We all have Christ. Um, I, I did a Bible study a, a couple of months back. It was this year. So if you go on our web page or on our app, uh, you'll be able to find it. Uh, it's on the Thursday night Bible studies, not the Sunday morning sermons. And it was called Overcoming Overload. And, and in week number one, we looked at the life of Jesus and we looked at six or seven or eight things in the life of Christ that helped him overcome the overload that was on him. No one was more overloaded than Jesus. And we looked at how he overcame this overload. And in week one, what we talked about, and it's a whole 45 minute, it might even be two weeks, where we talked about knowing who you are. Knowing who you are as a person. What's your personality? What's your personality type? And, and so there's a whole hour of teaching on this. If you struggle with knowing what's my purpose, what's my calling, how do I find this out? I would recommend two things. Number one, listen to that Bible study. Uh, we talk in there a little bit about one of my favorite books by Richard Baxter, The Mischiefs of Self-Ignorance and the Benefits of Self-Acquaintance. When you get honest with yourself, see, when you're honest with yourself, you can be real with other people. I've had people come to me for help and I've said, look, this is way above my pay grade. I, I can't help you. We need to get a professional counselor. We need to get this person. We need to get that person. Many times people come to see me and I say, oh, you know what? I think you need to make an appointment with Pastor Vinny. He really understands this issue and, and he's helped so many people, especially if it's with uh, mental illness or uh, addiction. And so he's so gifted in that area. I can certainly pray for you, but I recommend that you go see Pastor Vinny. What is that? That's me understanding. I know what I have and I know what I don't have. And, and we, like I said, we, we all have uh, Christ, certainly. But so I, I would I would overly, overly, overly encourage you to listen to that Bible study. And I said there were two things. The other thing is, is and they'll probably put it in the link down below. I highly recommend that you buy Rick Warren's book, uh, uh, <laughs> 40 Days to Purpose, uh, The Purpose Driven Life. So if you don't own The Purpose Driven Life, if you've never read it, the name of it went right out of my head. It happens when you turn 60 plus. But anyway, um, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're looking for more direction in the area, get the Purpose Driven Life. Listen, the capability of knowing and understanding and even embracing one's own limitations to actually identify the boundary lines of your own comprehension. Say, no, that's just beyond me. I believe that this kind of self-knowing actually begins to open the door in my heart, in my mind, for godly wisdom to enter our minds, our lives. So that when I do meet someone, if I'm honest about it and I say, man, I don't have the answer for this, a couple of things happen. One, I really need to start to lean on the Lord. And so guess what? I find out, you know what? Maybe I should walk away. Maybe I should go get some more preparation. Maybe be before I talk to them, I should pray about this. Maybe I should do a little research. I'll be able to come back with some verses of scripture. I don't want to talk to them out of my knowledge. And so I, I'm limited here. So let me go get filled up or <clears throat> it's beyond me, like I said, and I need to direct them to somebody else, but I can certainly pray for them. And Peter says, look, I don't have the answer, but I do know Jesus and Jesus is the answer. So listen, get real, be real, live real, <laughs> move out in your God given giftings, get to know and understand your limitations but don't limit your strength. Never trust your fears. Can I, can I pause there? Listen, never trust your fears because they don't know your strengths and they lie about your strength. Your fear doesn't want you to walk on the water. It's not comfortable when you're crossing the street, so it, it definitely doesn't want you to walk on water. 
So understand your strengths, know your limitations, and, and get a balance in these things. It's not very spiritual, but I thought this was hilarious. Dana Gould said, you rarely get a convincing lecture on playing to your strengths from a bald guy with a ponytail. <laughs> I just love it. I just, I just love it. <coughs> Excuse my cough. <clears throat> it's not COVID. I'm good. Don't worry. I've been tested. You say, you've been tested? I've been tested by the Lord. I'm good to go. Don't worry. But you rarely get a convincing lecture on playing to your strength from a bald guy with a ponytail. Think about it. Would you really listen to a guy with, with a bald head and a ponytail talk about playing to your strengths? No, stop. Cut the ponytail off. Those. Get real. Be real. Fourth, and uh, we might actually wrap this up tonight. Listen. No, you know what? I, I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, I think I've talked long enough. So here's what we've shared with you tonight. Listen, miracles happen in ordinary moments. You must be prepared when your moment comes. It's important to know what you have and what you don't have. And if you come back next week, I'll give you three more things that you need to learn about helping people. Now, I know we're a little shorter tonight, but that's our intent. We're trying to make these a little shorter so you can watch them and maybe talk about it with your family, talk about it with the people that you're with. And like I said, as soon as I'm done here, you'll be able to download all these notes. But you might want to just have a time. If you're there right now with your wife, your family, your kids, you might want to talk to each other about, have we ever seen a miracle? Have we ever seen God do something miraculous? And it doesn't have to be a healing. It can be a financial miracle, a, a, a physical miracle, maybe, but it could be a supernatural miracle in the sense that God has touched somebody's mind or moved a situation in your family. Talk about it for a second and, and kind of look around it and see, you know what? Maybe it did happen in just an ordinary situation. It was just another ordinary Sunday. This was just another ordinary prayer hour, but something miraculous happened. And then maybe have a little conversation about, are we really prepared? Would I really be ready to help somebody if I found somebody? And can we be honest with each other about what we're good at and what we're not good at? And maybe even in your marriage, maybe if you're a married couple right now, maybe you need to have an honest conversation about, guess what? We too are one in Christ, but maybe one of us is better at something than the other. Maybe one of us is better at this. Maybe we balance each other out. And look how God is making this all work together for his good and for his kingdom. And then what I really want to challenge you with tonight is this. Look, start to look at the ordinary moments of your life for a moment when God can use you to share compassion, to share kindness, to bring love into the situation, to bring a voice of reason, to bring a voice of hope, not to jump on the bandwagon of despair and the anarchy, but to bring a voice of healing and hope to the people around you that says, guess what? I don't have the answers. People are calling us. People are emailing us. Pastor, what should we do? What should we do? We've said this for the last four and a half months. I don't have the answers, but I know Jesus. And there are lots of people I meet in life and we don't have the answer for their problem, but we do have Jesus. So know what you don't have and know what you do have, but we all have Christ. Father, would you help us to be a church that is known for its compassion, for its empathy, for its sympathy, for its listening ear, not its shouting voice. God, would you help us be true and proclaim the truth, but to do it in love and to do it in compassion. And God, help us stop looking for blinding lights and flashing signs and dreams and visions. Help us to realize, God, that you move in the ordinary moments of our lives. If we will keep our eyes open, if we will be prepared, if we will be honest about what we don't have and what we do have, there will be people we can minister to that we can say to them, I don't have the answers for all your problems, but guess what? I can help you arise, not physically, but spiritually, I can help you rise up from where you are in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk. And I believe, God, that we can see people who will leap, who will rejoice, who will come to church with us and give testimony. And when other people see it, they'll say, man, that guy got changed. That woman got saved. How did God do that? Through someone who loved them, through someone who cared enough to be compassionate, 
through someone who cared enough to give them what they had. The bread of life, the water of life, Jesus Christ. Help us with this. In Jesus' name we pray. I love you. God bless you. I'll see you on Sunday for part two. Be praying for us. These are difficult hours as pastors and leaders. Pray for our church. Pray for every church where a pastor is taking a stand uh, and declaring the truth. But pray for us. Last Sunday's message was greatly received, and I thank the Holy Spirit for that. Uh, And I pray that you join us on Sunday for part two of The Healing of a Nation. God love you. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.